title of today's uh, sermon is We Have the Victory. And just as Brother Sapp was so clearly stated, I never would have made it without you. Oh, let me. <laughs> I thought He's that still was... singing. <laughs> Where we at, Dad? Huh? Where we at? We're right at the it's beginning. We're right at the beginning. It's still yeah, going. It's, still going. <laughs> <laughs> it's unplugged too. Starting at Genesis, Genesis spot. Huh? Is he starting at Genesis? No, no, no. We, I haven't given, I haven't given any verses yet. So, how often do you feel? Have you felt defeated? How often have you felt you can't find work? How often have you felt like you don't have friends? How often has family let you down? How often do you feel like this world is just against you? And how often do you feel that no matter how hard you try, that you just can't seem to get the victory? As Christians, we must understand that this world is not ours. And in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, it says, the God of this age has blinded the mind of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. How often have you sat there and told a friend or a co-worker or somebody and that they see Jesus in you and they tell you, are you crazy? That they can't understand the trust and love that you have for our Lord and Savior. They think, well, if you work hard and if you do this and do this, you'll be successful in this world. The phrase, the God of this world or the God of this age, refers to Satan. Satan is the major influence on the ideals, opinions, goals, hopes, and views of the majority of the people of today. His influence also encompasses the world's philosophies, education, and commerce. The thoughts, ideals, speculations, and false religions of the world are under his control and have sprung from his lies and deceptions. He is the ruler of this world. And when we say that he's the ruler of this world, he's the prince of the power in the air. Now that has much more of a significant meaning nowadays because you have the internet and he is the prince in the power of that air. Okay, It's difficult to go on the internet without seeing some type of anti-God or inappropriate type message coming to us. And many of us, even as Christians, can be sucked into that and we need to be careful. We need to be careful not to dabble in that because what it is, it's the bait, it's the hook. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and in dabbling and in looking at this stuff and saying, well, I'm a Christian, I know better, I'm just going to take a quick look at it or something, what we're doing is you're turning towards that, turning your back on God. Okay? So Satan is able to sp spread his beliefs and cultures around the world instantaneous. Years ago, it used to be, they would have to you'd look at the bad behavior of the father and the son would pick up on that. Or you look at the good behavior of the, of, of the father and hopefully the son picked up on that. Now... There's so much information out there. There's so many influences outside this the basic home. How much inform how much more information do children receive outside of what the family is giving them? The family used to sit there and use the Bible and God's doctrine as a as the as your base. That <laughs> we're not giving our children that anymore. Now, the music industry is infected with satanic influence. Today's stars are pop puppets to the anti-God movement, which like the Pied Piper of the past, they're leading the masses to destruction. We sit there and we say, well, I can listen to this music, it's not going to affect me. Yes, it does. Trust me, it affects you. When you keep hearing ungodly messages, and what goes in is what's going to come out. 
when we sit there and we play video games and where children are sitting there listening to cursing and swearing and women being raped and being beaten, what do you think is going to come out? Part you, of it, you're desensitized. Yes, and it, it doesn't seem as bad to you because I've seen it a hundred times. Have you, have you, have, think, think of... I grew up on the, the, the Friday the 13th movie, and some, so did some of my kids, because I think it went all the way to like 14 or something like that over the years. But we sat there and we watched teenagers being brutalized and stabbed and things like that. And guess what? It didn't affect us that much anymore. We didn't, we didn't cringe from it anymore. We sit there and we listen on, on TV to, about children being molested and all other kind of things. And it doesn't affect us any, as much as it did. It used to shock us. Now it doesn't shock us because, and, and, and we wonder, where is the victory in this? Where is, where is, where is God in all this? Where, where do we get the win? Okay? But this is not the first time that it seemed like God had suffered a great defeat. During the type of Jesus Christ's earth, earthly mission, the disciples and the followers of Christ must have felt defeated after the Messiah went to the cross. Many times throughout Scripture, Jesus tells the apostles what his mission was, but they didn't understand. In, in Matthew 16.21, it says, from, the time, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Here we see Jesus telling the disciples that there is a plan in place, that these things must happen. So how did the disciples react to what Jesus told them? Did they rejoice because the plan of God was coming to fruition? No. In Matthew 6.22 it says, Peter took him, took him aside and began to rebuke him. This is Christ. <laughs> Peter took Christ aside and started to rebuke him. He said, never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. I'm sure Peter, what Peter was saying is, in, in relation to what we would say nowadays, is, I got your back. Okay? <laughs> you know, I, I got you. This, the, we're not going to let this happen. Okay? But... Peter not understanding that this was the plan of God. And, and many of the, most of the Jews saw the Messiah coming as a conqueror. Did you ever think, why did Judas hang around if Judas didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah? Because he's thinking, well, if, if we're going to be taken over, I want to be with the in crowd. I want to be with the crowd that's going to be in power and is going to have the money. Judas was the money keeper. Treasurer, yeah. He was the treasurer. And he was a thief. Yeah, his hand of the till. Yes. Okay, so Judas had many ulterior motives for sticking around. And it was not because he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Okay? Russell's saying goodbye, everybody. Okay, okay. bye-bye. So we see here that Peter, like many of us, was short-sighted and not able to see or able to understand the full plan of God. We as humans have only earthly concerns and our concerns are rarely global, usually more selfish than local. In Matthew 16, 23, Christ tells Peter the very thing. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the mind and concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And how many times do we get caught up in that? How many times do we have just our small concerns and not looking at the global or the big picture and not properly trusting in God because God has told us that he'll take care of our each and every need. In Trusting in God is not saying, oh God, I know you'll trust, you'll take care of my needs, but I got to go steal this to them just in case yeah. you don't. Or are we, like, are we like Sarah, who God sits there and tells her that she will have a child, and she laughed. And then she laughed, and she went and tried to fix it on her own, 
and made a mess of, <laughs> created a whole religion of a people of a religion that is, has been anti-God since, since that time. And will be there till the end of time. So, so when Christ was betrayed and brought before the council, when he was lied upon and beaten, it must have been viewed as a great defeat. How did his disciples react? Well, Peter denied him. Because <laughs> you remember Peter said, we'll never let this happen to you. We got you back. But what did he do? Three times he denied him. I don't know him. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not with him. He had his back. He was just way behind him. <laughs> <laughs> he was in back of the back. Right? Yeah. So when when the time came for him to fulfill what he was saying, uh, no, I don't. I don't know. I don't know him. How many times have, have have you had friends deny you? Say they don't know you. Say they'll have your back, but when the fight comes, you see them running away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've all we've all experienced that one. Secondly, the apostles scattered. None of them were at the cross, other than John. Only John, yeah. Only John was at the cross. The other ones were in hiding. No, John was that his half brother? No. No, you're thinking of James. This was this was John John, the one who wrote uh Revelations. Was that his cousin? John. No, John the Baptist was his cousin. Okay. John the Baptist at this time had been beheaded. He's already dead, yeah. Yep. So the religious leaders of the time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, devoted themselves to destroying Jesus and denying that he was the Messiah. They dragged Jesus before the Sanhedrin and falsely accused him and tried him under the cover of darkness against Jewish law. When given a choice of who to release by Pilate, they demanded the release of Bar uh, Barabbas, a thief, and a murderer. So here you have your Lord and Savior, your Messiah, and here you have a thief and a liar. And they all screamed for Barabbas. So he was released. In John 19, 6-11, it says, As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside, inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Do you realize I have the power either to free you or crucify you? Jesus answered, you, have, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. And I'm sure they all thought that that was a great defeat. So, oh, what a great victory the Pharisees and Sadducees must have thought that they had. The teacher they exposed, the teacher that exposed them as hypocrites, was now delivered into the hands of the Roman Empire in, to be crucified. They had won. Or did they? So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on each side of Jesus in the middle. They sought to disgrace Jesus by marching him through the streets. This would be comparable nowadays to the perp walk. You know, when they, when they arrest somebody, and they make sure that the press is outside, and they say, okay, we're going to bring you through the back door to get you out in silence. And you go out there, and all the cameras start flashing. Yeah. The Inquirer, everybody else is out there. They're taking your picture mm -hmm. to... to, to to uh, quantify your disgrace. It's an important point you mentioned, Billy, the word Golgotha, the hill of the skull. Mm -hmm. um, you'll hear in a lot of Christian music, um, they use the word Calvary, yes. which is very inaccurate. It's a Roman Catholic thing, but it's literally Golgotha. Golgotha is the correct one. It's the hill of the skull. 
Yes. And you hear Christians sing many, many hymns, Christian songs. At Calvary, da, 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 all these songs, which is absolutely wrong. It's Golgotha, the hill of the skull. So it's Calvary very, comes from the Catholics? It's Catholic. And that's where he was crucified, right above it. Yes, the hill of the skull. So this is accurate, but you need to share Golgotha is the correct one. When you hear Calvary or Calvary, that's a very uh, Roman Catholic uh, cultic thing, a perversion. The correct, the correct is what Junie just said, is Golgotha. So we shouldn't be singing those songs and promoting false teaching and false doctrine. It's the hill of the skull, Golgotha. Well, then thank you for that. Um, and we have to be careful. Um, and that's why it's so imperative that we look to Scripture for the truth. We don't go by our culture. We don't go by, well, we've always done it this way. Or Christian songs, even. Yeah, or even Christian songs, because many of these things have been contaminated. Yeah. Okay? So, the Bible is the God-breathed Word of God. It's the truth. So, when we teach, when we learn, when we praise, let's do it from God's Word. Amen. Do it by His direction. That's the only way we can honor Him. We honor Him in spirit and in truth. Okay, So here, as I said, they paraded him through the streets to all to see, this defeated man. This is what happens to those who stand against the establishment, condemned for, the, for crucifixion, a death fit for a criminal, on, on how the, oh, how the mighty have fallen. How do we feel today when we see a famous or rich person humbled? <laughs> so we, we, how many people have we had, like Jared? <laughs> the sub guy from Subway. What happened to him? Oh, he, he was a child molester. Oh my that been going a long time. Yes. Oh, they had so many counts yeah, of child molestation him. against him. Yeah, he was. Agent. Yes. She played. Yeah, yes. she played a. Um, she played. She played a teenager for like three, two, three years. She was following him and tracking him. And he said some horrific things to her. Yes, him. and he was. He was. He was going across state borders, paying for little no, girls. Is this the guy that, that lost all the weight? Little boys. Lost or subway. The does the subway commercials? Yes. Yep. Wow. Yep. But but how many how many famous people have we had? We have Bill Cosby right now, who is who is under the fi under fire. Yeah, but most of those charges most of those are false. Most of those charges yeah. are false. And yeah. I mean, it's it's coming to fruition right now. It's yeah. coming about. Wow. Yeah. But how, we've had so many people. We have an O.J. Simpson. We've had so many people who have been disgraced. Yeah. Okay? So here, Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He was he, he rode into Jerusalem. Oh, Hosanna. One he, week later. Yeah. Yes. One week later, they're crucifying him. So... People are quick to turn on you. Yes, they are. Yeah, from the parade to the... <laughs> to the cross. Parade to the cross. From the parade to the charade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how do we feel today when we see a famous or rich person humbled? Think of some different celebrities that have been arrested or have lost their millions. How does the public react? How do you think the people reacted to see Jesus, Jesus humiliated, marched through the streets and disgraced? What a victory for the enemy. Or was it? While Jesus hung on the cross, they hurled insults and mocked him. And in Luke 23, 35-37, it says, The people stood and watched, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself. What's Luke, Juni, Luke what? Luke 23, 35-37. And as the people watched, the religious leaders and the Roman soldiers mocked and jeered him. What a victory they thought they had. They thought our Lord was defeated. Even the criminal who hung beside our Lord joined in. Luke 23, 39 says, One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. Have you ever been in trouble? And somebody who's in more trouble than you or, or, or the same trouble starts talking about you like you're a dog? <laughs> it's like it's adding insult to injury. <laughs> like, what are you doing talking? You, your situation's just as bad as mine. <laughs> but here this here this thief is is jeering Christ. Save yourself. Save us too while you're at it. He did you think he believed that Jesus Christ could save himself? No, he's just being a yeah. he's being an idiot. 
<laughs> well, that's really satanically inspired. Yes. Because if Christ saves himself, he can't save us. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so when people think that you are down, many will want to pile on. Do you remember that little that game we all played when we were little? Somebody would jump on the ground, and one person would jump on him and hold him down, and everybody else would sit there and pile oh, on. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like athletes, and, you know, yeah. when they do something, everyone oh. just turns, everybody loves them and then turns bad. against them. I know. Yeah. But, I yeah, so, so everybody, likes, everybody likes to pile on, and everybody likes to kick you when you're down. Mm-hmm. When you're, they say when, when, you, when you have money or you have fame, you have so many friends. You have so many people hanging around. Everybody wants to be at the party with you. Everybody wants to be your friend. The entourage. Yeah. Yes, the entourage. But then when you lose or you're struggling, where are all your friends? Because now they see you as losing. So Jesus Christ's apostles who had followed him and were here throughout his, his ministry, three and a half years of his ministry, they were with him. But where were they? Other than John, where were they? They must have thought that he was defeated. Frenemies. Frenemies, yeah. In the last three hours on the cross, Jesus cries out as darkness covered the earth. And in Matthew 27, 45 and 46, it says, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. About three in... About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lashabakthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? People present heard Jesus Christ cry out to the Father and the Holy Spirit, asking why, have, why they had separated from him. Here Jesus is seen at his lowest point, where he is, he was physically separated from the Godhead. Surely they must have rejoiced as they saw Jesus as defeated and near death. His total, his, his total failure was near. How do your enemies treat, tr- how do our enemies treat us when we're at our lowest point? Can you think of a time when you were just at your lowest and you needed that comfort of a friend and then they didn't give it to you? And you thought back, Everything that I did for that person. I did this for this person. This person needed me. I was there for them. And and, and they can't they can't give me this little bit. Even though Jesus was separated, he continued to praise the Father. Do we in our despair praise God? Do we rejoice even even in hard times? Or do we see ourselves as defeated? In John 19, 28 and 30, later, knowing that everything had now been finished, since and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so that they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the high, of a, of the high sop plant, which is like a sponge, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And in John 19, 38 through 40, It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body of Joseph. So Joseph gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in the tomb, cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. With Jesus now dead and in his tomb, his defeat was complete. The Pharisees and the religious leaders could return to their pious rituals, seeking salvation through the Mosaic Law, continuing to believe that they were the answer for the nation of Israel. 
They had defeated the one who claimed to be the very Messiah that they were waiting for. The disciples were in hiding, afraid that they, were t they too would be hunted, hunted down and killed like their master. I'm sure they must have been so confused. It seemed like the whole world was against them. I always wondered, though, why they weren't waiting at the tomb. Jesus had told them that he would return in three days. Did they not believe him? So why weren't there? They were. They should have been waiting. <laughs> they should have been waiting for the day. But they weren't. They were in hiding. Hmm. Jesus had told them that he would rise again after three days. Did they too think that this was a defeat for our Lord? It's interesting. The only ones who came after three days was the women. Yes, Mary. Mary came, yeah. Well, I have good news for you. This was no defeat. In the first chapter of the book of John, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was go with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is the Word, and He died on the cross and paid the price of sin, of our sins. That is, the sins of believers and non-believers. When we believe the gospel, which is that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, dwelt among us, died on the cross, paid for all sins, and rose after three days. Then you shall have eternal life. What all along appeared to be the greatest defeat in history was the plan of God, that he had created an eternity past to reconcile man and God, the greatest victory of all time. And as Christians, our daily walk in Christ is a victory. God has a plan for us, that plan leads to blessing and happiness and reconciliation with God. In John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We must only believe and we receive the grace of God, that free gift of his love and sacrifice. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not, not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, and that is Ephesians 2.8. God didn't leave, leave us alone to walk this path of righteousness. In John 14.16, Jesus said, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, and he may abide with you forever. In Romans 8.9-11, Jesus says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Amen. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And in Ephesians 4.30, Paul tells us, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but by, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Amen. So it is not you who, who sustains your salvation. It is the Holy Spirit. He seals you to the day of redemption. And if you're wondering what victory looks like, this is what the victory looks like, the glory of New Jerusalem. But I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it. For the glory God illuminated it. The glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. 